Good afternoon. Right, my name is Tim Yusuf. I'm one of the radiology fellows here at King's. And today I'll be talking not just about liver abscesses, but also expanding into endocavitary use of contrast ultrasound. So to give you a brief layout of what I'll speak about today, I'll give you a very brief introduction to liver abscesses and a bit of the history. I'll then talk about the use of contrast ultrasound intravenously with liver abscesses, and then go on to a variety of endocavitary uses. So as we know, liver abscesses are a well-known pathology. They've been around for a very long time, as bleep being slightly uncommon, with a higher prevalence in Asia. There has, however, been a roughly stable prevalence, although there's been a matter of improved detection, improved mortality following increases in technology. Typically, they come as pyogenic abscesses, the vast majority, although amoebic and fungal abscesses also exist. And as we've alluded to earlier, there are a wide variety of causes including local or distant infection, trauma, which we see a fair amount of here, biliary abscess, iatrogenic, or even cryptogenic in origin. And I won't go into too much detail on this slide at the moment, but there are a range of ways of imaging. Typically, ultrasound or CT are the most commonly used. On ultrasound, it presents, as we've heard a number of times, a focal liver lesion, which on grayscale ultrasound may be difficult to really define much further, but typically a hypoechoic mass with irregular edges and you may possibly see septations. On CT, you see the peripheral rim enhancement that's quite typical, along with a, a fluid density center, possibly irregular edges and septations again. So why do we actually need contrast ultrasound? Well, again, it's, it's been talked about a fair bit. It's adding to a differential diagnosis. It's taking that, that one step further to characterize it and to be, really give us an idea of how to guide management in that instance. Also for liver abscesses, the critical thing is temporal resolution. So we must also monitor the size and the excellent spatial resolution of contrast ultrasound allows us to do that. Another option is to guide intervention, which I'll come on to speak slightly more about in due course. So here we have an example, our patient with right upper quadrant pain and fever, a very typical presentation. And we have a, a focal liver lesion. But again, how much further can we really take it on here? We have a heterogeneous lesion, a hypoechoic central region. There's still a number, a fair way to go to characterize that. And as we've heard about from uh, our previous speakers, the EFSM guidelines are in place and mention to us how we can do that and indicate that there's a, a great number of uses of characterization. And this is our helpful cheat sheet, which fits on any ultrasound table. And if we highlight the area that says abscesses, we can see that what's described is arterial peripheral enhancement that may remain hyper-enhancing in the portal phase and may be hypo-enhancing in the, the late phase. There may also be enhancing septi. However, what's critical is there's no central enhancement to the fluid component. And if we look into that in slightly more detail, that's because of the expansion and merging of chronic inflammatory cells around the edge, resulting in hyperemia and that can give us a hyper-enhancing rim. There may also secondarily be defective venous perfusion due to this and due to the extent of the edema, which may result in a hypo-enhancing rim in the late phase. Furthermore, there is also a surrounding mass effect and surrounding abnormality of the vessels, which can cause us to have hyper-enhancing sub-segments or segments of liver. So these are our, our typical images of our, liver of our liver abscess patient, which we've seen earlier. You can see that there's arterial, early arterial rim enhancement. And I hope you can appreciate centrally within these, there is no enhancement in the early phase. And again, that persists in the late phase with a very similar appearance. And in this case, there's no washout. You can also see these small areas within the fluid components representing septi. But liver abscesses have a, a gradation. They don't simply appear out of nothing. They progress from inflammatory regions to micro abscess to a collection of a single cavity to widespread. So the first area to look at is the pseudotumors, an inflammatory region with no defined pus component. And this is important to recognize because it's known as a great mimic. It can have a variety of contrast appearances. In particular, it may mimic malignancy and can be very difficult to distinguish particularly as it may have early portal phase washouts. And here's an example of just an of how it can look in a different context. 
This is a patient with a gallbladder empyema, which ruptured, causing an adjacent liver abscess. However, you can also see nodular areas of very defined washout in the central image in the middle. And again, contextually, we know that this was, uh, this was a liver, liver abscess and inflammatory regions, but in isolation, you could easily mistake that for a malignancy. So this is where I'll diverge slightly and just suggest to you, is this the only way we can use contrast ultrasound to look at a liver abscess? Well, no, there's also the possibility of endocavitary ultrasound. And to go into that in more detail, we've always thought of ultrasound contrast as a truly intravascular agent. I'm going to encourage you to think of it as a truly intraluminal agent, as, a, as an off-label application. Normally, we, we dilute our, our ultrasound contrast in the circulating volume, 8 litres. However, I'm, I'm yet to see an 8-litre liver abscess, so I, I believe we have to use a much smaller dosage. So we typically use 0.1 mils in 50 mils of normal saline and deliver that through the drains. But why do we do this? What's the actual benefit of it? Well, we want to A, confirm the drain position, which can be quite difficult sometimes. B, we also want to define the internal aspects of the collection itself, particularly as there may be distant, distant parts of the collection which may not appear linked at first. Is there a communication between the two? Can we also guide drainage? Do we need to put a second drain in? And if we go back to our patients again, we can see the liver abscess and the intravenous contrast. We can also then see the appearances of the contrast after it's injected through the indwelling drain. And yes, you can see a very clear definition of the size of the edges. You can also see on the far picture that there's communication between distant aspects. So again, we don't necessarily need to put a second drain in to drain it. We know that they are connected. Is that the only endocavitary use we can use? Well, no, again, there's, there's a number of other places it can be used. We can think of any collection with the same, the same uh, thought process. It can be used in an intra-abdominal collection of any sort. What about other places? What about the renal collecting system? What about with nephrostograms, an indwelling nephrostomy? What do we want to do with that? We want to confirm that it's placed correctly. We also want to confirm there's drainage through the collecting system and identify the presence of strictures or complications. All three of those things contrast ultrasound is able to do. In addition, it's got the benefit of being radiation free. So we'll go through this case now. This is a patient with bilateral nephrostomies, clearly. On the left side, you can see that there's drainage along the collecting system. There are two fibroids in the pelvis, but there's no no contrast within the bladder. We've got the counterpart in the contrast ultrasound, again, delivered through the nephrostomy tube. You can see excellent pacification of the calyces. You can see that there's the ureter clearly defined along its length. And then because you've got excellent spatial resolution and you've got dynamic imaging, you can see that typical ureteric jet with individual microbubbles filling the bladder. Are there further uses? We've already had, uh, initially, we had alluded to the use of intravesical contrast ultrasound. Professor Daj in the United States has pioneered this. And he's shown that it's not only safe, but it's also as effective as a traditional micturating cystiurethrogram in children to look for vesicoureteric reflux. And you can see from the images, you can see definitive filling of the bladder, reflux through the dilated ureter, and up into the collecting system. And 94% of the time, the grade of reflux was either the same or the contrast enhanced ultrasound was shown to be more sensitive. Again, due to that ability to pick up individual bubbles. So where else? What about the biliary system? Well, we have a, this was a patient, a pediatric patient with a hepatojejunostomy, had a biliary drain in situ, and we wanted to confirm the position. We can inject contrast through the tube and again confirm that we've got filling of the roux loop We've got no leaks, we've got no fistula, we've confirmed the patency and the placement. Other studies, although there are very few in the literature, have taken this one step further and have actually gone to the extent of saying that we can identify strictures and the degree, whether they're complete or incomplete at the time of percutaneous cholangiogram. We've also had one of my colleagues, Dr. Dineshi, has done a, a study which shows that 
there is an indwelling uh, biliary drain, which although you see a pacification of the biliary system, you also start to see hepatic parenchymal pacification. And we go back to the idea of a truly intraluminal agent. We shouldn't get that unless we think that there's some sort of vascular fistula. And that was, in fact, confirmed at angiography as well. So we've got that, that potential to know that we are in a defined space and that we know that it shouldn't extravasate out of it. This was another patient who had a gastrostomy tube in situ. She came complaining of pain and the team were very concerned that the gastrostomy was misplaced. She was unable to move on to our fluoroscopy bed and so we couldn't perform the procedure. So what alternatives do we have? Well, we can do an ultrasound and we can see a small collection surrounding the gastrostomy tube. But how do we know if it's leaking or not? We need a dynamic mode of imaging. We inject some contrast through and we can see very clear pacification of the gastrostomy, which easily see, you can easily see filling of the stomach as well. We can also see definitively there's no filling of the collection surrounding the tube. So we know that we're safe. On the subject of oral contrast, there is very little evidence at present. However, we know that the microbulbs are stable within the stomach. And this is an example of, a, of someone's distal esophagus. You can see along its length, the fundus of the stomach as well. Although there have been studies using hydrosonography and intravenous contrast to look at the bowel wall, very little has been done for ingested contrast. However, a number of uses have been postulated, including the identification of peristaltic anomalies, definition of strictures, and also to look for gastroesophageal reflux. What are the lines and tubes are there? That's essentially what we're thinking now. So this is a patient with a porter cath. They had point tenderness. So we scanned along the length of the porter cath and we saw the line looked entirely normal until you came to the distal tip. So there's a small fluid collection in the perivenular region. But again, there's not much you can tell without taking this patient to fluoroscopy. So we injected through the porter cath and you can see a pacification of the entire line length. You can also see at the images at the bottom, rupture of the line. Again, a truly intraluminal agent. On the very far image, you can see that there is then a pacification surrounding the line tip. However, we're next to the internal jugular vein where the line should be placed, and there's no pacification there. That tells us that it's misplaced and explains the presence of a rupture. Studies have also been done to look at hysterosalpingograms. And this has been done to either confirm tubal patency or in fact the absence of tubal patency following laparoscopic sterilization. And there's found to be a very high concordance rate, 94 to 100% with traditional hysterosalpingograms. But again, we've got the benefit of being bedside and radiation free. I'll leave you with, uh, with one, one more slide about this. And this alludes to what Professor Sidhu said about Dr. Wang's lecture later on about interventional use. Here's an example of a ultrasound contrast filled needle entering and collecting system during a nephrostomy of a dilated system. And you can actually appreciate the bubbles moving back up the needle indicating correct placement. And I can assure you as you, as you uh, await his talk later, it's much more impressive in the videos. So there are a wide range of places where we can use endocavitary contrast ultrasound. We've mentioned liver abscesses as a route to describing a bit more. There is very little evidence at present, but it does appear to be safe, certainly in our anecdotal use of it. But why use it? Well, for localization and determination of positions of drains is a fantastic use. But also, you've got that ability to dynamically image You've got that ability to detect individual microbubbles with excellent spatial resolution. And that can be even be beyond the resolution of conventional fluoroscopic imaging. Bedside, you can perform it in patients who are in ITUs, who are unwell or simply unable to move to a bed. And you've got that aspect of avoiding radiation, particularly important as we've seen with intravesical contrast ultrasound. However, it is a case-by-case -case basis and it is used to answer specific questions. That doesn't necessarily mean there's a one size fits all and doesn't mean there won't be. But at the moment, the, the main uses are thinking about where you can use it to prove with dynamic imaging, 
prove with high degree of accuracy that something is appropriately cited. And so I'd leave you with advice to, to be adventurous and consider the use of endocavitary contrast ultrasound in your practice. Thank you.